<laughs> okay, boils and ghouls, you are listening to the 80s slasher librarian. I better return that book I borrowed from them. The late fees are a killer. <laughs> There's a lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. But it's written in the scriptures and it's not some idle claim. I didn't know I had permission to murder and to maim. You want it darker? We kill the flame. Before I get started tonight, I just want to do a quick thank you to Mortis Media, one of the best narrators on YouTube. Thank you so much for the shout out. I really appreciate it. And to everybody that has subbed since he did that shout out, welcome to the channel. I hope you enjoy your time here. We got a lot of slasher audiobooks for you to enjoy. Also, we have a guest voice tonight, DK, the subscriber who helped me get this book to make it possible to record the audiobook. We'll be doing the voice of Dawson. Here we go. Tonight is Final Destination, Death of the Senses, Chapter 6. Jack awoke and for some time had no idea where he was. He was warm, he was dry, and the pillow his head was resting on, a pillow, a rare enough thing in itself, had a faint floral scent rather than the acrid tang of the industrial strength detergent used in homeless shelters. He even felt clean. Where was he? The answers slowly came back to him as he stared at a collection of intertwined shapes next to the couch that gradually resolved themselves into one of Amy's sculptures. A tangle of thick blackened wires like an exposed skeleton partially clad in thin sheets of copper. A bird of some kind. A tall, long-necked one like a heron or crane. He remembered now. Lifting his head, from the pillow, he looked around to find himself in the living room of Amy's apartment. Jack lay there for a while, reveling in the almost forgotten pleasure of being comfortable. He took in the apartment in the soft morning light coming through the drawn curtains. The place was small but comfy, the living room warm and friendly. Amy's taste in furnishing seemed quite electric, but with a definite bias towards the comfortably used. There were more of Amy's wire and metal sculptures dotted around the room, ranging from a few inches tall to a couple of feet. A small craft table in a corner by the window was home to her tools, pliers, hacksaws, wire cutters, even a small brazing torch. It was obviously a hobby that she took seriously. Eventually, he heard a noise from one of the other rooms. Amy had just gotten out of bed, judging by the creak of floorboards as she moved around. He pushed the blankets away and sat up. Huh? He'd actually slept naked, something he hadn't risked doing for a very long time indeed. However well organized a shelter was, there was still always the risk that anything not under the blankets with you while you slept would be gone in the morning. He'd learned that lesson the hard way very early on. Today his clothes were right where he'd left them, on top of his bag by the foot of the couch. He stared at them. Great. The simple act of having a proper shower the night before had apparently washed some of the dirt from his vision of life as well. His clothes were fucking filthy. But they were all he had, and he had the feeling that Amy's generosity might not last much longer if she found him wandering out around her home stark naked. He rolled off the couch to stand on the polished floorboards and quickly dressed, suppressing a faint feeling of repulsion as he pulled the dirty material over his clean skin. He'd become so used to feeling grubby that he'd almost forgotten there was an alternative. Morning, Jack, said Amy, coming into the room with her hair tied back and wearing an oversized white toweling dressing gown that made her seem even more petite than usual. Uh, hi, he answered, hurriedly fastening his jeans. Amy padded over to the kitchen area behind a counter at the back of the room. You want anything? Coffee? Toast? Both would be good, thanks. Okay. She hummed something under her breath as she started opening cabinets and clattering plates on the counter. Before long, Jack found himself presented with a tray of breakfast. Y 
You don't have to wait on me, you know, he said. Jack, don't be silly. You're my guest. She handed him a knife and a butter dish. If you want anything else, help yourself. I'm going to have a shower. Okay, said Jack, unexpectedly stricken with the thought that he might not have left the shower anywhere near as clean as he found it. However, there were no shrieks of disgust from the bathroom, so he took it that his attempt to rinse everything down had been at least partly successful, and munched on his toast as the shower rumbled away. Somebody knocked loudly on the apartment's door, making him jump. Can you get that? Amy called. Jack went to the door, puzzling over three completely different kinds of locks before opening it. Bereave was standing on the other side. If nothing else, the way his expectant smile changed to an expression of utter shock and dismay made Jack's mourning. The what the fuck are you doing here? he spluttered. Good morning, Officer Bereave, said Jack with exaggerated politeness. Anything I can do for you? Bereave's surprise had changed to barely restrained rage. Where's Amy? he asked dangerously. In the shower. Jack knew it might provoke a nasty response, but he couldn't resist. Shall I tell her you called? He asked with a slight smile, trying to get a look that suggested, I just had sex, into his eyes. At least three different expressions fought for dominance on Bereave's hard and rapidly reddening face. Utter loathing won out as he shoved the door open and barged past Jack into the apartment. Amy! Amy! he yelled. Pete, I'm in the shower! What's this guy doing here? Bereave demanded, standing outside the bathroom door and almost pressing his face against it as he spoke. Pete, hello, I'm in the shower. Amy's annoyance was only a fraction of Bereave's, but it was still clear. Sit down and wait, okay? I'll be a few minutes. Making a bear-like growling sound deep in his throat, Bereave reluctantly sat down in an armchair in one corner. It was obvious that he normally expected to sit on the couch, but Jack had already returned to his breakfast. Toast? He asked innocently, holding up a slice. Bereave scowled at him. Amy emerged from the bathroom a few minutes later, rubbing at her damp hair with a towel. Hey, Pete. Bereave stood up, straightening his uniform. Amy, you okay? Sure, why wouldn't I be? She sat down on the only remaining seat, next to Jack on the couch. Bereave's irritation grew, but he forced it out of his voice. I just heard you had a busy day yesterday after you left me, he said, trying to sound casual. I got around, Amy told him, finishing with her hair and putting down the towel. Found where that psycho had been living. Bereave's gaze flicked over just about everything in the room, except for Amy's eyes. Fingerprints match from what I heard. What, you, uh, <laughs> planning on becoming a detective? Maybe? Amy picked up a slice of toast from the tray and took a noisy bite. You want to tell me how you did it? Tension was rising in Bereave's tone. Amy stared at him, growing annoyed herself at his inability to look her in the eye. I'm going to put it all in my official report when I go back on duty. Back on duty, right. Bereave ground his teeth for a moment, then jumped up from the chair. God damn it, Amy! He exploded, finally looking right at her. You carry on like this, they won't let you back on duty. Amy stood herself, facing up against the much larger man with equal determination. Carry on like what, Pete? Huh? Unauthorized investigations, Bereave yelled, entering without a warrant. His angry gaze burned over Jack for an instant. Hanging around with, with this guy. Oh, I see, Amy said coldly. That's what you're so pissed off about. Never mind that I came out of the hospital after being attacked yesterday, or that I saw a woman die right in front of me. I spent a day with a man who wasn't you. What's the matter, Pete? You jealous? No, that's... that's not true, Bereave replied flustered. He pointed a stubby finger at Jack. This guy's bad news, Amy. He's bad news. You should be keeping as far away from him as you can. But you invite him into your fucking home. Amy stepped back, crossing her arms. You done, Pete? No, damn it! Bereave's voice took on an almost pleading tone. Listen, Amy, 
One of the guys on the detective squad told me what you said to them about how you found that warehouse. It doesn't stand up, Amy. It doesn't stand up. They're going to want to know how you really found it. And if you did anything that wasn't above board, they're going to find out. That'll be it. Your career will be over at 24. Is that what you want? Of course it isn't, Amy told him subdued. So tell me, I might be able to help. I've been on the force for a long time. I know the right people to talk to. I can help you with this. He gave Jack another venomous look. But not if you stick around with someone who's just going to get you into more trouble. Amy stood silently for several seconds. Okay, Pete, thanks for that. She eventually said, voice flat, I'll take it under advisement, and now if you'll get out, I'd like to get dressed. What? Bereave asked in disbelief. Amy pointed angrily at the door. Get out, Pete. Get out! Amy, protested Bereave. Get out! For a moment, it seemed as though Bereave was going to erupt in anger. Every muscle tensed and his face turning red with rage. He turned and walked out, slamming the door behind him. Amy, shaking with fury herself, rushed back into her bedroom, leaving Jack alone and awkward in the living room. Not sure what to do and deciding that any attempt to talk to Amy until she was ready would only make matters worse, he decided to play things safe and finish his breakfast. Amy didn't reappear for more than 20 minutes, by which time she was fully dressed and, Jack registered, made up. Her face was still stony, though, but she managed to give him a not very convincing smile when she saw that he was doing the dishes for her. Jack didn't really know what to say, so he waited for her to make the first move. She was still wound up, pacing silently back and forth. Sorry about that, Amy said at last. You've got nothing to apologize for, he answered. Pete's not normally like that, she said in reply to the unspoken words. Really, the only time I've ever seen him wound up like that was when... She paused. Jack gave her a questioning look. It doesn't matter. It's his business. But I just think that he's feeling guilty about not being there when I got attacked the other night, and he's overcompensating. Jack made a grunt of general agreement not wanting to air his own opinions of bereave to her just yet. So, he said, drying the last plate and standing it in the rack by the sink. About today. How are we going to go about it? Do both of us go and find these people together to try and make it easier to convince them? Or do we split up to cover more ground? Amy sat down, looking at her hands. Um, I was thinking about this for most of the night. She said in a voice that had suddenly gone very small. Jack moved out from behind the kitchen counter and crouched in front of her. And? And what Pete said was something I'd been worrying about all night anyway. You know, I am going to get asked a lot of questions about how I found out about that warehouse, and there's going to be no point lying about what happened. One, because eventually they'll find out anyway, and two, because... Because I can't think of any explanation that sounds even remotely plausible. So tell them the truth, said Jack. Tell them it was me. Yeah, right. She clapped her hands together, interlocking her fingers. A homeless guy had a vision, and I believed him. You know, I don't think the NYPD has much of a policy on psychics. Jack saw where the conversation was going. So you're not going to... Amy looked up from her hands a resigned expression on her face. What am I going to say, Jack? While I was off duty, I visited a bunch of public figures and told them that they'd been chosen as targets by a serial killer who's now dead, but they shouldn't relax because they're on death's list and they're going to die some other way instead. They wouldn't just kick me off the force, they'd probably lock me up. Right, Jack stood up, Amy avoiding his eyes. So I guess I'm going to have to do this on my own. Jack, look, she said. I do believe it, and I believe you. I've seen too much not to. But if I get involved any more and go around telling people that I believe you, then that'll be the end of my career, and, and I don't want that to happen. But I will help you, she added, standing up and facing Jack. Okay, I'll help you. 
I will help you find out where all these people actually are, and I'll give you some money. I don't need any money, Jack insisted. Jack, Amy's voice became forceful, matter of fact. You do need money. These people that we're trying to find are either rich or famous or both. You're not even going to get through the door looking like that. Jack looked down at his clothes. You mean filthy torn jeans aren't fashionable anymore? Amy smiled a genuine, a genuine smile this time. Only with skateboarders. Listen, you go and have a shower while I'll go to the ATM. Then we'll go and get you some new clothes so you'll have a chance to... A chance of getting near these people without having security throw you out on the street. Then I'll make a few calls and find out where they all are. That sound fair? I suppose. Jack reluctantly agreed. Good. She looked at his face, cocking her head in an angle as she examined it. And you know what else we can get you? What? She grinned. A razor. Despite his misgivings, Jack had to admit that Amy had been right as he looked at himself in her full-length bedroom mirror. The clothes he was now wearing weren't exactly Armani, but they were a long way from the unwashed, weather-beaten layers he'd been wearing day in, day out for months. Even though it was just a simple blue shirt, black pants, and shoes, the difference from what he had become used to was so great he could hardly recognize himself. The same went for his face. Gone was the unkempt, scraggly beard, and after he'd shaved that off, Amy had gone one step further and actually given him a haircut, explaining that she used to be the family barber for her father and brothers. No more stringy, shoulder-length hair. He now had a cut that looked somewhat stylish, even if his ideas of style were probably years out of date. Whatever, she'd done a pretty good job. He couldn't shake the feeling that he still looked like a homeless guy who'd Somehow gotten lucky and found a new set of clothes, though. He couldn't work out why until he spotted what was troubling him. It was his skin. No matter how much he cleaned it, he wasn't going to be able to wash away the street roughened texture from his hands and cheeks, the elemental aging around his eyes. It had been over two years since he'd been forced out of his last small, crummy apartment. From his face, he thought it looked more like tin. You decent? Amy called from the living room. When Jack answered yes, she came in. Wow, she said, walking in a circle around him and looking him up and down. You know, you don't look all that bad. You scrub up pretty well. Thanks, he said, still examining his face in the mirror. God, my face really took a pounding, though. I hadn't realized how old I look. What are you talking about? Amy stood next to him, looking at his reflection. You don't look a day over 30. Jack's mouth dropped open. That's cause I'm 28, he complained. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you look great, really. Amy took his arm and led him back into the living room. Anyway, I made a couple of calls, called in a couple of my favors. She picked up a sheet of paper from the table and handed it to Jack. I got the addresses you need. Jack looked at the list. Dawson Donahue, Katie Aston, Dominique Swan. Hey, they're even in the right order. I'm efficient like that, Amy smiled. No joy on your mystery rapper, but until you remember the song you heard, there's not much I can do. You've already done plenty, Jack told her. Thank you. No problem for my white knight. She took his hand and squeezed it. Come on, I'll give you a ride to the first one. The exciting thing about being in business, Dawson Donahue mused, was that there was always surprises. No matter how much you planned, how many contingencies you had covered, there was always room for the unexpected. That, to him, was what set him apart from the rest. What had made him a millionaire ten times over by 26, and already on course to double that within the next two years. 
any monkey could sit down and make plans. It was being able to react quickly and decisively to that unplanned that was the mark of a true businessman. To take the unforeseen and figure out how to turn it into an opportunity there on the spot. He'd done it many times already, and he intended to go on doing it for a very long time indeed. That said, this particular piece of unexpectedness was something from which he couldn't see any way to profit. The man in the reception area wasn't. His security staff had assured him. Some kind of mafia hitman or disgruntled ex-employee with a grudge and a concealed weapon to blow him away. He'd apparently been sitting waiting for him in reception since the morning, even though he knew that the receptionist would have told him that Mr. Donahue was a very busy man and would not be available without a prior appointment. He knew that because he'd made it standard policy a while back, after a disgruntled ex-employee with a grudge, though thankfully not a concealed weapon, had showed up one day and taken a swing at him. He wondered what story the man had spun to convince the receptionist and security to let him sit around on the not exactly luxurious chairs for what must have been a good four hours. Probably said that he was after a job. That did at least show a certain tenacity, which was always a good thing when you needed workers to be able to stick things out under tough conditions. But as Dawson watched the man through the glass door to reception, briefly held up on his way out by an assistant who needed his signature, he got the feeling that the man wasn't here to ask for a job hauling garbage. Sure, all his clothes looked as if freshly bought for an interview, and his cheap haircut was probably no more than a day old but there was something about him that set off little warning signals in Dawson's head. Nothing major. If there had been, the man would already have been picked up by security and literally thrown out onto the street. But there was an air of urgency about him that suggested he had something on his mind other than finding work. The assistant's paperwork signed, Dawson took a breath, and prepared to step out into reception. He'd been told some time ago between meetings that the man was there and asked if he wanted him removed. But Dawson hadn't even cared enough to get rid of him, assuming that his uninvited visitor would eventually get bored and leave. Now he was going to have to face him. It wasn't as though he could even sneak by unnoticed. The four-foot-tall studio portrait of himself on the wall behind the reception desk, along with the framed New York Business Magazine covers, on which he'd featured over the last couple of years, meant that only a blind man could fail to recognize him on the way out of the building. He could always go out the back way through the truck yard, but to hell with it. He wasn't going to be freaked out in his own office by some loser desperate enough to hang around in the reception area for the best part of a day. He opened the door and stepped through it. The man glanced at him, did a quick double take between him and the pictures on the wall, then stood and walked towards him. Mr. Donahue... He asked. That's right. Dawson said, aiming himself at the door and slowing down without actually stopping. If you hear about a job, just fill out the form like the ladies there asked you to. I don't hire people directly. Not low-level garbage men anyways, he thought. I'm not here for a job, the man told him. I need to talk to you urgently. Make it quick. I've got a tennis match in one hour and the big game when I get home and I've gotten no intention of being late for either of them. Dawson said. The man tried slowing his pace, and when that failed to hold up, Dawson started walking backwards alongside him. Mr. Donahue, this is really important, and it's vital you listen to me. Your life is in danger. That made Dawson stop. What? I said your life is in danger. Is that a threat? Dawson demanded, raising his voice enough for the security guards near the door to hear. They perked up immediately, eager to break the monotony of their job by kicking somebody's ass. Are you threatening me? What? The man looked genuinely shocked, which was reassuring at least. No, 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 not at all. The opposite. I'm trying to help you. Listen, he said, leaning closer and lowering his voice. My name's Jack Curtis. You don't know me. I'm nobody. Until today, I didn't know who you were. I'll have to fire my publicist, Dawson said, not sure where this was going. Curtis blinked as if not quite registering the joke. 
Somebody else did know you, though, and he was planning to kill you. Now Dawson saw where this was going. Hints of a death threat, assurances of knowledge of the killer's identity, and a subtle but definite demand for money to reveal the information. It wasn't the first one he'd had. I see. He said, glancing over in the direction of the guards and subtly gesturing for them to come over to him. And this guy's coming after me, right? Well, no, he's dead. Dawson waved the security guards to a stop. Hold on, you're telling me my life's in danger from a dead guy? What is he, a, a zombie? Clearly, the reason this Curtis was prepared to wait around for hours just to talk to him was that he was insane. No! Curtis protested, starting to get visibly frustrated. You don't understand. This guy, the dead guy, he was planning to kill a bunch of people and- Why? Dawson interrupted. Because he was a psycho! I see. The joke was over, and if he didn't set off soon, he was going to be late for his game. Well, this little encounter would serve as a reminder of the need for punctuality in the future. Okay, Guy wanted me dead. Now he's dead. End of problem. I've gotta go. He took a step, only to have Curtis move in front of him, eyes wide. No, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. Dawson's look summoned the security men. The first person on his list, Chelsea Cox. The chick on the TV? Yeah, her. She was on his list and she died yesterday. Dawson frowned, waiting for the two men to flank Curtis. Yeah? Pity. She was hot. Guys, get this asshole out of here. If he tries to follow me to my car, call the police. Curtis looked at the men next to him. He was tall, but the security men were big, and knowing he was beaten, he backed away towards the door. You were next on the list, he cried. It'll seem like an accident, but it won't be. You've got to be careful. Anything could kill... The doors closed, muffling his voice. The two security guards ushered him out of sight down the street. I am so sorry about that, Mr. Donahue, wailed one of the receptionists, a pretty brunette whom Dawson had on occasion idly fantasized about screwing. I had no idea he was going to go wacko like that. I thought he just wanted to talk to you about a job. That's why we have a human resources department. Dawson snapped back. He briefly considered talking to it about replacing her, but the crushed look on her face was enough punishment, he decided. She was doing a perfectly good job, after all, and it was the actual laborers, not the office staff, who needed to be reminded who was boss on a regular basis. Anyway, he said, his voice softening. No harm done, right? No, Mr. Donahue, the girl said, relieved. Maybe he'd get a shot at her after all. Are you going to be back in today? No, won't be back until tomorrow. So take my calls. I'm going to enjoy a nice, relaxing, nut-job-free game of tennis. Unless... He said with a smirk as he walked towards the door. I have some kind of accident. The two security guards hadn't actually touched him, but they'd made it perfectly clear to Jack that they didn't want him heading back in the direction of the Donahue offices, escorting him a few dozen yards down the street before going back and standing menacingly outside the doors. When Donahue himself emerged and headed down the street in the opposite direction, one of the guards followed him while the other stayed on the door, glaring at Jack as if daring him to try to follow. Shit! No wonder Amy had been so reluctant to get involved. Thinking about it, he had sounded like a lunatic, some crazy-eyed fool of the kind that accosted people on the street with prophecies of doom, the kind that a few years ago he would simply have rolled his eyes at, or worse, and pushed past. He waited in the hope that the guard would turn back and leave his boss alone, but Donahue disappeared into a gap between two nondescript commercial buildings down the street. Jack remembered seeing a parking lot where Amy dropped him off, the kind where the cars were stacked one above the other and brought down on a hydraulic platform by a valet. He wondered why Donahue didn't park in the yard that ran around two sides of his building. 
but a quick glance at the noisy and grimy garbage trucks growling around in there suggested a reason. Besides, if what Amy had told him on the drive uptown about exactly how Donahue had made a fortune from taking out the city's trash was true, by cutting costs and wages to the bone, preemptively breaking strikes by sacking union activists, and then underbidding the competition, leaving his car around the back of his own offices sounded like a daily invitation for pissed-off workers to, accidentally, back a truck into it or put a garbage can through the windshield. Jack's desire from the other night not to have to work for someone like Donahue had only been increased. Still, he'd tried. He'd spent half a day waiting around for Donahue and delivered his warning when he'd finally gotten to see him. If Donahue didn't pay any attention to it, then that was his problem. Beeping from a reversing garbage truck echoed around the yard. Jack looked through the chain-link fence, seeing the yawning metal mouth of one of the dozens of trucks slowly lumbering around the yard a robot dinosaur with an appetite to match. The discolored steel teeth of its compactor flashed a sinister rictus grin at him. Damn it, his warning hadn't been enough, and Jack felt somehow compelled to keep trying. Donahue might be in an arrogant little shit, but if that was a reason for someone to deserve death, then Manhattan wouldn't have any more overcrowding problems. The side of the truck's compactor had reminded him that there were any number of horrible ways Donahue might meet an accidental demise, and in his line of work, any of them would smell bad. He had to try again. One eye on the security guard, who was still giving him dirty looks. He crossed the street, heading for the payphone that he'd spotted outside a gas station a short way down the block. Donahue had said that, after his tennis game, he was going home, and Jack felt sure that Amy could find out where that was. She'd already agreed to drive him to the workplaces of the other potential victims, and maybe she could be persuaded to take him to Donahue's house. Reaching the payphone, he pulled several quarters and Amy's cell phone number from his pocket and dialed. She answered on the third ring. Hello? Amy, it's Jack. Jack, how did it go? I thought you were going to call me after you'd seen Donahue so I could take you to Katie Aston's. I only just got out. He wouldn't see me until now. What happened? He didn't believe me. There was a pause at the other end of the line. I'm sorry, Jack, Amy eventually said, a clear implication of just like I expected evident. What are you going to do now? Jack was about to answer when a screech of tires caught his attention. He looked around to see a sleek Mercedes CLK 55 convertible pull out of the parking lot and roar up the street past him, slush splattering from beneath its wheels. Even without a proper look at the driver behind the tinted windows and closed top, Jack knew it was Donahue. The license plate, G-R-B-A-G-E, was something of a giveaway. The car made a sharp turn into the entrance of the gas station and pulled up next to a pump. Can you find out Donahue's home address? He asked, watching as Donahue climbed out of the Mercedes. Sure, but no, Amy gasped from the other end of the line. Jack, no. It's one thing finding out where these people work, but you can't go to their homes. He didn't believe me. I've got to try again, Jack argued, still watching Donahue, who was only about ten yards from the payphone, opening the Mercedes filler cap and inserting the pump's nozzle. He took something from an inside pocket and lifted it to his mouth. For one horrible moment, Jack thought he was about to light a cigarette, but it was just a stick of gum. The discarded silver paper fluttered to the ground at Donahue's feet. Jack, I'm not going to take you to these people's houses. Do you have any idea how much trouble I'd get into? Not as much as they will if I don't warn them. The nozzle was in place and automatically spewing gas into the tank of the car. Donahue looked up and saw Jack watching him from the payphone. His jaw tightened with distaste as he glared at him. Not wanting to seem as though he was following him, Jack turned away, catching a faint reflection of Donahue and his car in the glass side of the booth. No, Jack, listen to me, Amy said insistently. You warned him. You've done all you can. If they don't believe you, then that's their problem, not yours. You can't start following them around like their personal bodyguard. There's a word for that, Jack. Stalking. It's not the same thing at all, Jack said, 
already knowing in his heart that any judge he might find himself in front of would disagree. The reflection of Donahue's car seemed to have become a lot darker while he'd been speaking, but he couldn't work out why. I just want to... An orange flicker in the reflection suddenly blossomed into a huge ball of boiling fire, an explosion erupting from the back of Donahue's car. Jack whirled in shock, instinctively lifting his hands to cover his face, but there was nothing there. Donahue was still standing by his Mercedes, looking bored as the gas tank filled up. He turned around again to stare at the reflection. It was the same as when he first noticed it, no longer dark. Jack? Amy asked as he looked back at Donahue. Still there, still bored. Then he flinched, frowned, and reached into his jacket. He looked at a cell phone. With a casual practice flick of the thumb, he flicked it open. Jack, are you there? His car! Jack realized with horror. Jesus Christ! His car's going to explode! He rushed out of the phone booth, ignoring Amy's worried, questioning voice as he let the handset drop and raced across the forecourt of the gas station. He could hear Donahue's phone ringing, a shrill, irritating tune. Donahue lifted the phone to his ear, thumb hovering over a button, about to press it to take the call. The phone was sent spinning away as Jack slapped it from Donahue's hand. It clattered across the concrete, the battery breaking loose and skittering through the dirty, churned-up snow. Jack felt a sharp pain in his side as he stumbled to a stop alongside Donahue's car. He'd hit the protruding handle of the pump nozzle, which made a nasty cracking sound as it ground against the inside of the car's filler cap. More pain followed a moment later when Donahue, acting more out of surprise than anything, hit him in the chest with one elbow, knocking him to the ground. What the fuck are you doing? Donahue yelled down at him. I just saved your life, Jack shot back, putting a hand on the side of the car to pull himself upright. If you'd answered that phone, your car would have blown up, and you with it. Donahue stared at him in utter disbelief. What? Jack pointed at the nozzle of the pump, which was now sticking out of the Mercedes filler cap at an angle. A trickle of fuel ran down the car's flank. I thought you was smart. Don't you know? Gas fumes are explosive, he yelled. Donahue backed away from him, retrieving the pieces of his phone. Maybe, but cell phones don't set them off, he said, attempting to slot the battery back in place. It's the same wiffle ball safety bullshit as laptops making planes crash. Now, he struggled for a moment with the battery before it finally locked into place with an audible click. Maybe you think you're genuinely helping me, or maybe you're just insane. I don't really give a shit, but if I ever see you again, I'm going to call the police. If I'm feeling generous, or my security guys, if I'm not. In fact, fuck it. I'm going to call my guys anyway. You got that? I've had death threats from the fucking mob. I'm not scared of you. Now fuck off. Jack looked at him, then slowly turned and walked away. He was sorely tempted to punch Donahue in the face, but restrained himself. As appealing as the idea was, it would only get him arrested, and he still had three more people to find and save. Save. He'd done it, hadn't he? In his mind's eye, he could still see the darkened reflection blooming with orange light. Donahue's car consumed in fire. That hadn't happened. It might have been too late for Chelsea Cox but at least he'd managed to stop Dawson Donahue from dying. With Amy safe as well, that was two out of three so far. Now, he felt a lot more confident about making it five out of six. He headed back to the phone booth. There was still time for Amy to take him to Katie Aston, the next person on death's list. Dawson drummed his fingers against the MERS steering wheel in frustration. His tennis game had been badly off, and he'd been beaten in straight sets by a man almost 15 years his senior, and at least $5 million less in net worth. Now that was embarrassing. But not quite as embarrassing as the realization that his encounter with the crazy guy, Curtis, had genuinely shaken him up. 
He didn't believe a word of what Curtis had been saying, or the bleedings of the safety Nazis about the dangers of just about everything in the modern world for what if at the back of his mind. Whether Dawson believed it or not, there was one thing that was for sure. Curtis believed it. Was he in danger? Had he somehow been marked for death? He shook his head. The idea was ridiculous. If he ever did see Curtis again, he was going to show him just who had really been marked for death. The bastard had scratched the Mercedes. Not only that, but he damaged the filler cap as well. The flap covering it wouldn't shut properly. If he got the chance, he'd make Curtis pay for it one way or another. He glanced at the dashboard clock. He was running a little late, but the traffic ahead of him, going over the Queensboro Bridge towards Queens, didn't seem too bad. Barring accidents, he should get home in plenty of time for the game. I don't want to say it, Jack, but go ahead, you can say it. That was a complete waste of time. Jack sighed and leaned back into the passenger seat of Amy's battered old Dodge Stratus. You know, I think I'll have to agree with you there. The attempt to find Katie Aston had been a complete bust. Her television studio, the only address Amy had been willing to find for her, was a long way downtown and had taken them ages to reach through the Manhattan traffic. When they finally arrived, they discovered, to Jack's dismay and Amy's annoyance, that Katie wasn't even there that day. Her next show was scheduled to be taped the following morning. Okay, so what now? Amy asked, turning the car back uptown to head for her apartment. Now? I don't know. Jack stared at the darkened avenue ahead, the canyon of brick, concrete, and glass stretching off into the distance. Guess I'll have to try to find Katie and your chef woman tomorrow, and I still don't have a clue how we're going to find the rapper. Don't, don't suppose you've remembered any of the lyrics from the song you heard? Just words, oozies and bitches and hoes. Oh my, Amy finished, grinning. Jack smiled back at her. At least you saved Donahue. Anyway, what kind of asshole uses a cell phone while he's filling his car? Seriously. A rich asshole who thinks the rules don't apply to him, I'm guessing. Jack turned his head to look out of the side window seeing his reflection in shop windows as they cruised past. The rippling image of the car rose and fell in brightness as they passed under street lamps. The sight made him remember something, brighter and darker, brighter, and the reflection of Donahue's car. It had been dark, as if it was night, but when he'd been at the gas station, it was still daylight. Oh my God, he mumbled, tensing in the seat. Amy looked at him. Jack? she asked, concerned. I didn't save Donahue, Jack said, as much to himself as to Amy. It wasn't time for him to die. It was going to happen at night. He leaned forward in his seat and stared up at the black sky overhead. The full moon was clear, even through the glow of the city's lights, staring coldly down at him. Amy, he's going to die now, now that it's night. Somehow, his car's going to blow up. We've got to get to his house and warn him. Jack, we, we, we talked about the whole turning up uninvited at the rich people's homes thing already, remember? Amy shifted in her seat, seeming very uncomfortable. If we don't, he's going to die, Jack insisted. He looked pleadingly at Amy, who seemed torn. All you have to do is find his address. You don't even have to come with me. You can sit in the car around the corner if you like. I just have to get to his house before something bad happens. Conflicting emotions played across Amy's face. Then she reached for her phone. Dawson turned the corner, pushing the button on the dashboard remote for the garage door opener and slowly rolled his Mercedes down the concrete slope into the basement garage. The garage was more than big enough for another car or two, but for now only the Mercedes lived there. Maybe he should get an SUV or something just to fill up the space. He stopped the car and got out, locking it with the remote after waiting for the garage door to close again. It might be technically inside his house, but you could never be too secure. Walking to the stairs ahead of him, 
He paused to lift the lid on the big wheeled trash can squatting against the back wall of the garage and toss in the empty Diet Coke can he drunk on the drive home. He winced at the smell that wafted out. It was still two days before he had to push the thing out onto the sidewalk for the scheduled garbage pickup as well. Maybe he should get someone to swing by early. Bounding up the stairs, he checked his watch. Still plenty of time before the game. He unlocked the door at the top and stepped into the kitchen. Last night's mostly empty Chinese food cartons gazed at him from the counter. A slightly stale smell of fried rice and vegetables tickling his nostrils, reminding him that he was getting through far too much takeout at the moment. Mom wouldn't approve. He grinned at the thought and brushed the cartons aside to make room for the 12-inch deep pan pepperoni pizza he was about to order. First things first, though coffee. He needed a quick hit of caffeine before the game. Normally, he would have brewed up a pot of his favorite Colombian blend, but he wanted something fast, which meant the instant cheap and nasty shit. He filled the kettle and put it on the stove, turning on the gas and pushing the igniter. Sharp electric cracks came from the ring, but no gas. What was wrong with this damn thing? He could hear a faint hiss of gas, but not as loud as usual. Was the pipe blocked? He kept a finger on the igniter, leaning closer to the ring. Tiny flashes of lighting cracked between the electric contacts, but still no flames. Annoyed, he banged a fist on the stovetop. Much to his surprise, it worked. Something rattled. He heard a faint echo through the pipes coming out of the basement, and the ring burst into life, blue flames jumping up just inches from his face. Dawson let out a hoot of shock and jumped back. That had never happened before. Somewhere in the back of his mind, the weird guy's warning resurfaced, but he ignored it. Coffee, pizza, then the game. Beneath the stove, out of Dawson's sight, the gas pipe connecting the house's main to the stove shivered momentarily, as if the impact of his blow was still echoing through it. With a tiny crackling sound, a welded joint on the pipe split. It was only a very small fracture, but it was just enough to let a gentle, almost inaudible hiss of gas escape into the kitchen. In all the time he'd spent in New York, Jack had never been across the Queensboro Bridge, and if the traffic was always like this, then that wasn't a bad thing. The tangled crosshatch of iron girders above and around the car felt like a cage holding them in, trapping them. It's going to take forever at this rate, Amy complained, fumbling with the street atlas on her lap as they crawled along the bridge. Even when we're off the bridge, we've still got a couple of miles to go. Maybe it'll ease up once we're across. Jack offered hopefully. I wouldn't put money on it. At least they were past the halfway point, with Roosevelt Island behind them. I just hope this guy's not doing anything dangerous. Pizza, imported beer, cell phone switched off, a luxury reclining leather armchair, the game on the biggest plasma screen money could buy. What better way to spend a completely self-indulgent evening? Normally, he would have added female company to the list, but, well, there was a game on. The hell with it, thought Dawson. He was going to have a cigar as well. Traffic on Queens Boulevard was better than on the bridge, but not by much. How much further? Jack asked. About a mile. Jack banged his hands against his legs in frustration, willing the cars ahead to clear. Dawson carefully returned the box that held his illegal Cuban cigars, bought perfectly legal over there, on a trip to London, to its hiding place in a locked drawer, neatly clipped off the end with the cigar cutter, and looked for the lighter as he clenched the fat Romeo e Giulietta between his teeth. He wasn't quite sure why he'd started smoking cigars in the first place, but it always seemed a lot more refined than puffing away on cigarettes. Besides, the way things were going in New York, it was soon going to be impossible to smoke a cigarette in public. 
whereas there was a number of more upmarket places where cigars were not only welcomed but actively encouraged. He'd already started to attend such places, as it never hurt to make influential contacts. But hell, he was still only 26. There was still time for him to enjoy beer and pizza rather than brandy and lobster. He found the lighter, lifted it to the tip of the cigar, and put his thumb on the button. Okay, this has been Chapter 6 of Final Destination, Death of the Senses by Andy McDermott. Also, uh, before, I, before I say anything, I want to say thank you to True Resident Evil. That, that's their name on Twitter. Here on YouTube, it's DK. Thank you so much for the lines you have done so far for Dawson. I can't wait for you to do all the lines for him as we go forward. But yeah, I gotta say guys, I am just loving this book. And honestly, in the beginning, I wasn't sure how this was going to play out because I knew that I am a huge Jason, Chucky, Michael, you know, Freddy. I love those books. I do love the Final Destination movies, don't get me wrong, but I wasn't sure how these audiobooks were going to play out, the Final Destination ones, compared to the slasher ones. But I'm hooked. I see lots of views and stuff on these uploads so far, so I know there's plenty of people listening. And if you're anything like me, I'm really enjoying the story. I can't wait to see where it goes. I didn't want to stop recording tonight. I just wanted to power through and just keep going. But I'm trying to keep these uploads around 45 minutes to an hour to conserve my own voice. That way, you know, I don't have to skip a few days and wait for my voice to come back. So, but I'm going to be back very soon. I'm going to be back tomorrow with another chapter of this book. I don't want to put it down. But yeah, we got uh, so much going on here. Dawson Donahue, you know, he seems like a, a, a rich bitch prick. But honestly, if somebody came up to me spouting what Jack's spouting, I'm probably going to have a similar, uh, you know, if I'd never heard of Final Destination, I would have a similar reaction that Dawson had. So I can't really hate on the guy right now. You know, I can't hate on him a lot. I can tell he's kind of a douchebag, but I can't hate on him. As far as Jack and Amy go, I'm really liking how their relationship is growing. You know, and it was kind of upsetting that Bereave came in. And what his argument with Amy kind of set her back a bit with this whole uh, mission that her and Jack are on. But it's nice to see that she's giving in now and getting the home addresses. Because I was really kind of getting irked that, uh, you know, she was letting what Brief said get to her and hold her back from what her and Jack are trying to accomplish. But I I'm glad to see that Jack's able to pull her away from that a little bit. Uh, you know, get her head out of her ass, so to speak. So, guys, what do y'all think? Is Mr. Dawson about to light that cigar and get blown sky high? Or are Jack and Amy going to be able to intervene? I can't wait to find out. I'm going to be back tomorrow to make sure you guys know what happens next in Final Destination Death of the Senses. Be sure to click the like button, guys. I really appreciate it. Also, thank you again to Mortis Media and any listeners here that have never heard of him. Please go check him out. I'll put a link in the description below to his channel. He is the one of the best Reddit narrators. He's got a great accent, a great voice for it. He does really creepy narrations. Go check him out, please. He did a big service to this channel last night doing a shout out. And welcome to all the new listeners that may be listening to this right now. Thank you for coming around. Hope you enjoy your stay in the 80 Slasher Library. All right, guys. I'll see you soon. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening and. Have a great night, guys. I didn't know I had permission to murder into me. You want it darker? We kill the flame.